Hello, welcome back. Today we will speak about the history of international dispute settlement in The Hague. And we will particularly explore the foundations of institutions such as the Permanent Court of Arbitration and the International Court of Justice. The leading question is, why did people start thinking about creating international courts? And what global value did they mean to protect? Why do we need international courts? And what do you think was the first global value? The roots of The Hague's role as the international judicial capital of the world lie in 1899, when the Russian Tsar Nicholas II and his Minister of Foreign Affairs, Count Muraviev, decided that the International Peace Conference that they wanted to organize would take place in The Hague. The first Hague Peace Conference was convened in 1899 and the second one in 1907. Together, these Hague Peace Conferences set the stage for international diplomacy and for international relations between states on world affairs as we still see them today. More importantly, the Hague Peace Conferences were foundational for the system of international dispute settlement that we currently have. Yet, we must also realize that this system was designed by a very select group of only 26 predominantly European states. The Russians had pursued a rather exclusive invitation policy. Most Latin American states were absent, and also the young South African nation was not invited. The political motivations behind the idea to convene a peace conference were to hold the process of competitive armament and to alleviate the financial burdens that came along with this process. Hence, the central themes of the two peace conferences were 1. Disarmament and 2. Peace. So peace can be called the first global value. Was this what you expected? Do you believe peace is still the most central and important global value today? And do you think the word peace today means the same as it did one century ago? Maybe you pause for a moment to ponder on these questions. In the 18th century, great ideas about peace had been developed by the philosophers Jeremy Bentham and Immanuel Kant. Subsequently, in the 19th century, some NGO-like peace societies had blown life into these ideals. The Hague Conferences aimed to translate such ideals into political realities. And in this spirit, one of the key questions that was discussed at both conferences was how conflicts between states could be prevented and resolved through peaceful means of dispute settlement. So the traditional idea of peace related to the absence of war between states. During the conferences, the diplomats and lawyers present discussed traditional methods of dispute settlement, such as negotiation, mediation and good offices. But the central and most groundbreaking diplomatic conversation concerned the idea of arbitration and even the establishment of an international arbitral tribunal. In the 19th century, American states, and in particular Latin American states, had already taken the lead on this matter with the conclusion of several arbitration treaties. Following in those footsteps, the Hague conferences constituted the moment and place at which the method of arbitration was taken to another, more universal level. The 1899 and 1907 Hague Conventions established the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which, as you will learn in Module 3 of this MOOC, is actually not a court. In Module 3, you will learn what arbitration is and what the Permanent Court of Arbitration does. We will also explain to you how arbitration is different from judicial settlements and how the Permanent Court of Arbitration differs from the International Court of Justice. But for now, let's return to the Hague Peace Conferences and the start of the 20th century. The lofty ideals of the Hague Peace Conferences of 1899 and 1907 were of course soon smothered by the fog of the First World War. The ideal of peace and the understanding that international cooperation was needed to achieve such peace survived the war. Or perhaps the horrors of the First World War ultimately provided a great incentive to effectuate an idea that had been on the agenda for the third peace conference scheduled to take place in 1915. And this idea concerned the establishment of a permanent court of international justice. Indeed, in 1919, associated with the newly created League of Nations, such a court was effectively instituted. On 15 February 1922, the first session of this court took place under the presidency of the Dutchman Loder. 
The founders of the League of Nations, most notably the US President Wilson, had utopian aspirations for a new world order after the First World War, and a new court was this soon called the World Court. After the Second World War, the League of Nations ceased to exist and was replaced by the United Nations, an international organization that is still in existence today. Similarly, after the Second World War, the Permanent Court of Justice was replaced by the International Court of Justice a new court but largely patterned upon its predecessor. In the United Nations system, the International Court of Justice, or the ICJ as we also call it in short, is given a lead role as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Moreover, in the UN system, all states are under an obligation to settle their disputes peacefully. This obligation is laid down in Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the UN Charter. In order to comply with the obligation to settle disputes peacefully, states can turn to the ICJ, just like individuals can turn to their national courts. However, there are major differences between the ICJ and national courts, which reflect the inherent differences between national legal orders and the international legal system. The most prominent differences are these. Since we do not have an international police force, decisions of the ICJ are difficult to enforce. Moreover, the ICJ has no compulsory jurisdiction, which means that it can only adjudicate those disputes that states have referred to it and where states have explicitly consented to the ICJ have jurisdiction to settle the case. State consent is crucial. And as you know, this is one of the main themes of the entire MOOC. And we will discuss this with you further in Module 2. We hope to see you there.